following interview was conducted with Carolyn Jones, Associate Executive Vice President for Academic Affairs at Meriday on, for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Tuesday, February the 3rd, 2009 in her home in West Lafayette. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Good afternoon. Tell Hi, us Katie. Somebody. How are you today? <laughs> Tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents in early years. Well, I'm a Buckeye, Katie. Um, I was born in East Cleveland, Ohio, because that's where the hospital was located, but I really spent my preschool years in Lakewood, Ohio. Then my folks moved to Fairview Park, um, continued to live there until I'd graduated from my folks continued to live there until I graduated from college, so I went all through K through 12 and at Fairview High School with it. Uh, my parents, um, Robert Jones, better known as Bob to most people, and my mother was Florence Jones, um, were both Hillsdale College graduates, and so I had that collegiate experience and expectation in my background. My dad was a salesman, and my mother was a school teacher. Um, my dad was very involved in civic affairs. He was involved in city council. He was involved in uh, the thespian group in Fairview. He was extraordinarily involved in the church. And it seemed like there, every time there was a fundraising campaign, my dad was leading that one. My mom had been a school teacher before they were married. And then she continued to substitute teach after we moved to Fairview. She was involved in a lot of volunteer activities also. Uh, in uh, Parent Teacher Association, in church. Uh, she was the resident director of the local thespian group. She started a children's theater, and she was one of the better known soprano solos in the city of Cleveland. So I had two wonderful role models. <laughs> What was high school like? Any activities that you were engaged in in high school? Oh my goodness. You know, the people said I was a chip off the old block. There there certainly were. I um, played French horn in the band and I sang in the high school choir. I think I played every sport in intramural athletics that we had. I was in the class plays. Uh, I was an officer in the Friendship Club, which is uh, the girls' YWCA club that we had at high school. I was on student council. I was a member of the, gym, the uh, girls' leader club. Um, worked on the newspaper and the yearbook, was a member of the National Honor Society. I had a good time. Very active. Any siblings? Or are you an only child? I'm an only child. Okay. Then after, uh, tell us after high school, where did you go to college? And tell us about college. Going to being an undergrad was my first foray here into Hoosier territory. I went to DePaul University down in Greencastle, Indiana. How'd you happen to select that school? strange sometimes how things happen, isn't it? I had thought in my wildest dreams, wouldn't it be fun to be on radio? And I was looking at liberal arts colleges and Paul had a radio station. And I thought, aha, we've got a good match here. Anyhow, there, there were several other schools that I thought were pretty good matches too, but I went down there and just fell in love with the place. And I said, this is for me. And I knew one other person that had gone there. So I was a pioneer in that sense, I guess. Tell us a little bit about college and your organizations and your major and campus life. Well, I was a, I was a history major, um, Bachelor of Arts in History, but a lot of my classmates thought that my BA stood for Bachelor of Activities with a minor in history, so I just continued on what I'd been doing in high school and my, my family tradition with it. I was a vice president and president of my sorority, Delta Zeta. I was president of the Student Education Association. I was on the dorm staff for two years, and if we translated that into Purdue terms, it would be um, an RA over in the residence hall. Uh, I was on the freshman orientation staff, which I guess translated in boiler terms, it would mean that I was a Boilermaker Gold Rush leader. Uh, the Association of Women Students was a major organization on campus. My senior year, I was treasurer of that. I had been uh, on the Senate. I was... Um, I was really bitten by the theater bug back then. Go back to my what my parents had done. So I was the producer director of our major campus musical. And uh, that, that was a fantastic experience. I learned more about leadership and more about, about theater probably from that. We had a, just an unusual group of people happened to end up in a class of about 425 in Greencastle, Indiana. The uh, co-writers, um, both have had careers on Broadway. The tenor soloist that we had has spent his life on Broadway, either on Broadway itself or traveling in shows. The uh, music director went on to become the choral director of the New York Philharmonic Chorale. 
and considered by Leonard Bernstein as one of the world's greatest choral directors. And here we all were, just down in Greencastle, Indiana, having a wonderful, wonderful time together doing some of these things. I was, uh, when I had time, I was involved in athletics, uh, just in the intramural level with it. We didn't have uh, competitive athletics at that point. Um, and did quite a few other things in little theater with it. So I suppose what my friends said that I had a bachelor in activities is probably right. But I, like but I ended up at least graduating with honors. So it wasn't all just in the activities area. Uh, after, uh, no, did you go on to graduate school or what uh, occurred after you graduated? Oh, after I graduated. Well, at the time I graduated, I had decided as a very wise senior that I had been in school since I'd been five years old and it was time to go out and start doing something else. So I went back to the Cleveland area to Rocky River, Ohio and became a junior high school, now they would call it middle school, uh, social studies teacher and taught geography and history. And my last year there, um, taught two sections of English, which was a minor that I had in college. And then then did you go to grad school? Then I went to grad school. I, I decided that if I was going to stay in public education, I'd better have a master's degree. Um, just the economics of it, you were higher up on the pay scale. And so I started thinking about what I really wanted to do and realized that I, really enjoyed teaching students something about history rather than teaching history to students. And so I went to Michigan State and got my master's, I thought I was getting my master's solely in um, high school guidance, you know, guidance and counseling, because that's what I thought I wanted to do. But I, about halfway through, I kept hearing these people talk about the student co college student personnel field, which was another option in education. I'd never heard anything about it. But the more I began to hear about it, the more I was intrigued. And they, they were willing me to offer me an assistantship for summer school. And I discovered if I played my electives right, I could end up with a double major. So I thought, this makes sense. Go do that. And since I'd been on leave from Rocky River as a, a teacher, I felt obligated to go back there. And they offered me a counseling position at that time. So I went back as a counselor. After you got your master's? That's right. Mm -hmm. And then what, what transpired after that? Well, when I was working on my master's, Albion College came and really wanted me to come with them as a, an assistant dean. And I, I really felt obligated to go back because Rocky River had been very good to me. But I also discovered that you're back there as a counselor. Counseling wasn't what I thought it was going to be. Um, you ended up, if the art teacher didn't feel well, you went down and covered the art class. Uh, I, I covered the library at noon so that the librarian could have lunch. All of these things needing to be done, but they seemed to get dumped on the counselors with it. And we were, the principal was retiring. Uh, we were going to be getting a new principal and Albion College came back to me and said, Carolyn, we still really want you up here. And I thought, opportunity never knocks twice, rarely knocks twice, so why not? Go try it, use that other major, and see how you feel about it. So that's what I did. I went up there as an assistant dean. And, and how did you stay there for a while? Or? I did. I uh, was an assistant dean for one year, and then you never know how these careers are going to turn with it. I was just, I was on a 10 month appointment. In the summertime, I was just getting ready to go to the World's Fair, and I was going to meet a friend in Pennsylvania, and we were going to go on to New York together. And the phone rang. It was the Dean of Students, and he informed me that the Dean of Women had just tendered her resignation, and I was Assistant Dean. And uh, did I have any interest in being Dean? And I said, well, Chuck, I, I knew him because we'd worked together. I said, Chuck, I tell you, right now on the top of my priority list is getting to Pennsylvania because I'm 20 minutes late leaving here. I'm going to the World's Fair. I'll talk to you through when I get back. Now talk about somebody being brash and maybe stupid. Oh, right. No, that, that was me at that time, but I did talk with him when I got back. And obviously at, at that time, a month before school started, Albion was in kind of a bind and he said, uh, would you like to be interim dean or dean? And I thought, well, why not be dean? <laughs> and uh, so then at the ripe old age of 27, I became dean of women at Albion College. 
And uh, he told me afterwards, he said, Carolyn, one of the things I really admired about that conversation is you had your priorities, and I really agree with you at that point. They were right. <laughs> oh. <clears throat> well, then go on and tell us about your career path before you came to Purdue after that. Uh, well, I, uh, from Albion, I went to the University of Illinois uh, as in a graduate program that I initially thought I was just going for one year. They had an NDEA institute there, and they were bringing in 25 people who had had experience in working in higher education, particularly in the college personnel field, uh, supposedly for a one-year experience. It was a government program, so we had our way paid. And I thought, this sounds wonderful. Um, it would give me a chance to expand some horizons, and I would really enjoy doing that. So I did. And halfway at the at the end of the year, I was halfway through the coursework toward a doctorate, and the job market was absolutely terrible. And so I decided, well, why not? I'm here. I might as well go ahead and finish this. Uh, so what I did, you did that. Had you resigned from Albion? To I had. I, I had resigned from Albion at that point mm -hmm. with it. So I went ahead and uh, finished my doctorate. Uh, however, the, the last year, though, an interesting thing happened, and it happened at Purdue University. Dick Nelson, who was a professor over in education, um, received a Fulbright, and his wife, Betty, wanted to travel in Europe with him. And so Bev Stone was in kind of a bind. She was looking, she needed somebody that had some experience to fill Betty's slot for a year but only a year because it was quite clear Betty was going to be coming back here. And perhaps her closest professional friend was her counterpart at the University of Illinois, Miriam Sheldon. And at a dean's conference, Bev and Miriam had lunch and Bev was commiserating about what she needed to do. And Miriam said, I've got the perfect person for you. Her dissertation is portable. She's about two thirds the way through it. Um, I think you would enjoy her, and she would profit from having a, another Big Ten institution, not only on her resume, but having the experience and showing somebody else what she's capable of doing. Uh, so they came up and talked to me, and uh, I came over here, and I was excited about Purdue, and apparently they felt at least I would be an adequate replacement. So. I came over here thinking I was going to be here for one year, and so I'm very, very fortunate to have stretched that one year into 32. All right. So your first thing then, you were with the assistant dean there in 71 and 72. And That's right. And uh, I knew Betty was coming back, and I'd been here for about six months, and I really fell in love with Purdue. And I knew that that job wasn't going to be there. And it was a time economically where people weren't just creating new positions. There weren't going to be any new positions. I knew that in the dean's office. And so that wasn't going to work for me with it. And I, I knew that ahead of time. That wasn't news or surprise or anything that I had anticipated might happen. So I did a lot of interviewing and turned down a few other opportunities. And in August, the opportunity in Bill Fishang's office came up. Bill was the new vice president for student services, and obviously I was extraordinarily excited about it. Here was something that I thought would be a lot of fun, and became a candidate for it, and was very, very fortunate to become the successful candidate. Good. And tell us a little bit about what, uh, what went on in their uh, responsibilities, and you, did you advise student organization um, in the student life? Just tell us a little bit about some of the activities that you were involved, responsibilities there in the... Fishing, Dr. Fishing. Well, it was interesting. The, the job was not terribly well defined, and he admitted. Was it a new position? Yes. Oh. Well, he had had, there's probably a little more to the story than that. Oh. Uh, O.D. Roberts had worked with him for, O.D. had been the dean of men here for a very long period of time. And his health became such that he no longer could do that, but he continued to, he wanted to continue to work. And so he went up and worked with Bill for, a year doing a few things and you, you've got to remember at that time the dean of the uh, vice president for student services had 15 offices that that person was responsible for and Odie's health was such then that after a year he no longer could work and so my position was semi-new one might say within 
Um, but it was pretty clear to Bill that he wasn't going to be able to handle 15 departments by himself with it. And by but, this time, the merger of the had taken place, had it not? What merger? Men, men and men and now it's no, no, it was it, it was it was still still, oh, okay. still dean of men and dean of women. So those were two of the 15. Oh, okay. Uh, departments that we had. But Bill had come from the, the faculty. He was a professor of entomology. He'd won most all of the teaching awards over in the School of Agriculture, and he was an extraordinarily student-oriented person with it. But when he came to student services, he began to realize that student services in the academic world were operating as two separate worlds. And his dream was to bring the two of them closer together with it to see how they could support each other, and they really all were educators. They were just having different sets of expertise within this. And so one of the challenges he gave me was to try and make some of that happen, to, to build bridges. Um, another challenge that he gave me was that he felt that the student service departments, the 15 of them were if you're an Aggie, you call it silos. If you're a historian, you call it fiefdoms. Um, something that Purdue has had a long history, as well as most other institutions of, of having on their campuses. And he wanted to bring those departments a little closer together, but with 15 of them, he couldn't do it all himself with it. Uh, not bringing them closer together necessarily organizationally, but programmatically, getting them to, to collaborate and work on things. So that was the, the second piece of my job description, but he also warned me. He said, Carolyn, with just two of us, there are going to be a lot of other things that are going to come up that you're going to have an opportunity to work with. Um, and he was right. He, he was extraordinarily right with that. And so uh, among the other opportunities I had, and they were wonderful, um, was to, to be the leader for the Student Services Internship Program, where we worked with the College of Education and had six graduate students working in internships um, within Student Services. And so I was, I was coordinating that program and I was teaching a course that education had related to that program. We quickly saw a need to uh, have some staff development activities going on because that would also help bring our units closer together if we had them working on common things. So Where were you located? Because Sleeman Hall was not built at that time. No, no. Uh, we were up in, in Hubby Hall, second floor Hubby Hall. I believe that uh, state, state and federal relations are in that area right now where we were. I had a wonderful office. It was unique. Uh, now, Hubby was generally the last building to to get much renovation to it. And I don't know who the other people had been that had used that office, but I had five different shades of battleship linoleum on my office floor. Uh, Again, a unique blending of color. And, uh, <laughs> color and culture and, and everything else in the furniture that I had matched the floor. It was a little of this and, I, and, sure. a, and a little of that. So it was a real showpiece in, in that sense within. But also during that time, we. Um, we're in an era where we're getting much, much more federal and state legislative and regulatory activity impacting areas that student services were responsible for. And so I was sort of the, the person that kept track and tried to find out what was going on in all of those areas. I visited the library frequently and did a lot of reading the Federal Register, much more than I ever wanted to with it to alert our departments, because this was before a lot of professional organizations, at least in student services, were doing this. This is happening on the federal scene. They're talking about this on the state scene. You folks ought to be aware of it. And if you want to input and impact it, this is what you need to do with it. So I, I did that. Uh, <clears throat> Provost Haas set up uh, two task forces for one on um, recruitment and one on retention. Uh, I would, Bill chaired both of those. I was the staff person for them, so, and the they, two task forces were made up of the deans of the, what we called schools back then at Purdue. I was the one that provided all the background reading materials for them, took the notes during the meeting, wrote the drafts of the report, and finalized the report for them uh, with it. So that was another one of those that was added. Uh, was the platform marshal for commencement, and that was one of the best activities. Uh, it was just a thrilling activity to be involved in the, in the commencement exercises. 
I was the coordinator for the Distinguished Student Convocation. I was the designated representative when student services needed one, so I worked on fundraising campaigns. I was on about five different task forces down in personnel, which is now uh, human resources, as they were looking at wage scales and job classifications and uh, employee grievances. I was involved in all of that piece with it. Um, in the mid-70s, uh, a piece of federal legislation called Title IX was passed, and I became the university Title IX coordinator. And, uh, and this was in addition to all these other things I was working on, and had the responsibility to see that the university was in compliance, all of the, the academic and uh, activities areas. I wasn't involved in the employment piece on it um, with Title IX. So I was involved in everything, the transformation of intercollegiate athletics to the changes in some of the student activities, to seeing that every one of our schools was, was in compliance with all of that. For the researchers, Carolyn, what were some of the departments that uh, made up the student services? You mentioned 15. In addition to the dean of men and women, what were some of the other? Would that be financial aid, perhaps? Uh, I take a stab at 15. No, I don't know. No, there are, I'll, I'll just I'll, give I'll them a, a sample what they... Uh, well, Dean of Men, Dean of Women, Admissions, Financial Aid, as you mentioned, what was called the Placement Office, which is now what Center for Career Opportunities. Right. We had a Measurement and Research Bureau at that point that was was a piece of student services. Convocations would what, be in there. What, Registrar too? Registrar uh, was, was in there. Uh, three ROTCs were in there. Intercollegiate Athletics was in there. Uh, Intercollegiate athletics? Yes, recreational sports. Now you can imagine having responsibilities building for all of this. Uh, why he needed a little help and why I ended up having so many marvelous opportunities of doing all the things that I did you and luck. having the influence and the you impact. Lucked out. You lucked out. I, I really, really did luck out with him. Um, student hospital was, was in there. Um, psychological services was in there, and I haven't been counting, so I don't know no, how close I, I am to. A pretty, that's a pretty wide range. It was, it was an extraordinarily wide range. Just convos and athletics, just for openers, and then with the uh, men and women, it was just a, a, a big chunk. Yeah. So go on, when, and anything else in student service? Well, the, the other thing that, uh, that I was involved with that, that comes to mind, you'd mentioned about Schleeman Hall, uh, when the opportunity to um, build the addition on the old pharmacy building, which later was named Schleeman Hall, came about and used it for student services. Uh, I chaired the academic planning committee on it, um, and that's where we worked with schedules and space, and you, you get all of the users together and, and talk about what do you want this building to do for you, uh, what are you going to do in the building so that we can get the right relationships. That's a challenge. So I, I, I did that piece also. So I smile every time I walk by, by yeah. Schleeman Hall with, <laughs> with that. But there were a, you know, obviously a lot of people involved in that. I just tried to bring out of them what it was they wanted it to do and, and to convey that to the schedules and space people. Keith Murray was the, the one that I worked with there on that project mm -hmm. um, so that he could convey it to the architect. Right. It's like a lot you need speak in their language, but also to speak in the language of things that you'd like to have in it, you know, so that's, it's a, mesh, a meshing of them. They do that in other structures, too. That, that's right. That's just part of the Purdue process, and it's a marvelous part of any kind of process to get the users up front right. uh, talking about what they're going to be doing. So I had a wonderful experience in student services. I would say so. Very, very, and very challenging, as you said. It was. I, I look at every opportunity as something that is a fun challenge for me. And, you know, I, I consider my strength, Katie, as being breadth. There are a lot of things I can do or I can figure out how to do. You can find people that can do each one of them better than I can. But if you're looking for somebody to do lots of different kinds of things. And bring them that, together. And bring them together. That's my niche. So I need to always work. I, I discovered that early on in small offices. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Then what came next? And then the uh, executive vice president of academic affairs. Is that when you moved on over there? That's that's when I moved over there. How did um, that come about? Was that when Dr. Ringo took over? Or? No, it was oh. when Tip Tyler hmm. took over, and uh, Tip realized that he too was now in charge of an academic enterprise, 
He replaced Dr. Haas, correct? That's correct. And there wasn't much help in getting that done. And there, there were two things in particular that were, were coming up that really concerned him. Uh, one was the North Central Accreditation, which is going to happen in two years. And that's a mammoth project to work on, to pull together, and it had to be done out of his office. And the, the other one was the growing amount of activity that the Commission for Higher Education was engaging in as it related to the academic piece uh, rather than just the fiscal piece of higher education. And so he put together a position that would be those two things plus other duties as assigned with it. Um, and I was kind of intrigued by that. I had worked on, I'd, in student services, I was the one that did the coordination of the student service piece of that accreditation exercise 10 years prior to that. And as a history major who had a smattering of political science courses and uh, who then got involved in looking at state and federal educate legislation when I was in student services, I thought that might be kind of fun to do that. Um, so again, I put my resume in my, and uh, was the fortunate person to be selected for that opportunity. Back on the back of a minute. Dr. Fishing, uh, was Dr. Grace then in charge when you left there? Fishing had left there? Yes, um, yes he was. I, um, Dick Grace and I worked together for about six months in student services. Mm -hmm. okay. Dr. Fishing went back to his own department? That's that right, he went back to entomology to teaching. Back to his first love. <laughs> Let's move on then. Go ahead to the executive. Some of the things that you were involved in there. Uh, I thought we'd start with the. Um, you mentioned the reaccreditation. I make a couple comments on that. What for the researchers? What the commission that you were the North North Central mm -hmm. Association of Colleges. Mm -hmm. What was your involvement with that? Well, my my involvement in that was I was the university coordinator. In other words, I had to make everything happen at the university. Um, and the regional with, campuses as well? No, this oh. was uh, this was just the West Lafayette okay. campus at All this right. point. With it, every campus is accredited separately, right. okay. but but my responsibility was just the West Lafayette campus with it. So we had, my responsibility then was to to see that we had a self study that was conducted and written up, um, to see that we had a team uh, that was selected for us that was going to be a team that would understand what we were trying to do at Purdue. So the accreditation team you're speaking Yes. Uh, so I, I worked with the North Central folks in trying to get a team that would be, would, well, for example, they wanted to send um, someone from a dental school. And I said, they're, they're just a mismatch. Mm -hmm. A person might be a fine person and a great accreditor, but just going to be a mismatch. Uh, so they really understood what we were trying to do at Purdue and, and brought people in. Because accreditation is not only just evaluating and, and looking at you, it's trying to help you, too, with it. And, and I felt what we needed to, to emphasize was that let's get as much help as we can to get better sure. with it. Because if there isn't something for us in this, it's... A lot, of, a lot of effort and a lot of resources going into it, to pulling this together with. Um, and then also to do all, make all of the arrangements for the team visit when they're here and see that the visit goes well for us. So the first time around, it, it went well, it worked. Purdue was given the maximum 10 years full accreditation with it. And then I did it the second time uh, in 1999 which was in a very, very different environment at that point with it. That um, what I did in 89, it was sort of an expectation you were going to get the full 10 years credit. Reaccreditation in 99, that was not it. And I was doing it in an environment when approximately half of the Big Ten institutions, which you would think would get full accreditation, got full accreditation but with stipulations. And so there were some things that they had to go back and work on and do a report in two or three years. Uh, best way I can describe it is probably remediation. Uh, and they had really difficult times with that. It was continuing to drain their resources on things they didn't really want to spend their time on, but they had to do that. Um, so it wasn't a given that you were going to get that. 
in, the in climate 99. Was different in the, cli the climate was very different, and the, some of the standards of accreditation were very different at that time. Uh, learning com outcomes assessment was part of 99, whereas in 89 it wasn't with it. And that was one that was tripping a lot of people up. As you look at uh, Purdue's history also, 99 was a critical juncture because President Beering had resigned and our trustees were going to be searching for a new president. The president Beering had announced his retirement. And so accreditation, I felt, became a way that we as a university community could make a statement to the trustees and to the president and to the candidates that they, that they were recruiting about who we were, where we were, what we thought we did well, what we needed to work on, and plans that we had for working on that with it. And it seemed to me that if we were an institution that received stipulations on our accreditation while the trustees were looking for a new president, that might really hamper them, that there would be some people saying, I'm not going to come in if we've got that albatross mm -hmm. hanging there. So there, it was a different environment in externally and internally in terms of the not pressure that other put, people put on me, but pressure I felt for the institution Sure. at, at that point with it. Uh, but we did it. We came through 10 years with no stipulations. And uh, Tim McGinley, who was chair of the board of trustees then and still is now, has told me on several occasions how much that report helped them understand the university and help them in recruiting a new president. That report plus the report that the visiting team wrote about us. So we had an outside evaluation that they could use. Very good. Very and, timely. Well, it was. And what, and what we came across as, um, both in the, in the report and the visit, was an institution that was in very good shape, an institution that had a lot of ideas but lacked resources. And if we could only get some resources, we were going to just burst explode on the national and international scene to a much greater degree than we'd even had that opportunity to do. And if you look back over the past 10 years, that's exactly what happened. They brought in a president who was a very good planner and got everybody going the same direction. He didn't have to spend a lot of time cleaning up a lot of messes, but rather could keep it moving. And he went out and got an enormous amount of resources that allowed us to do some to implement some of the ideas that we had right right okay so cool uh the um that university student you i think you talked about the student learning assessments council were you on that oh uh, well i was chair of it okay. uh i just mentioned the uh, i mentioned that when i was talking about the accreditation because there were right. some some pretty stringent standards there that we had to meet in the 99 one. Yes, way. yes. And so the only way we were going to do it was to get a group of people together, one from each college or school, and sit down and say, how are we going to do this? Because we're not doing real well here right now with it. And there probably hasn't been much push at that point for that either. Well, there, there wasn't, but there, there needed to be more. And so that was our job, to sit down and make that piece happen then. We didn't get a stipulation in that area, so uh, my, my my hats off to most of them were assistant or associate deans in their school, but to that group of us that managed to sit down and figure it out and make it happen. Cool. Yeah, there were a lot of good people working on that and a lot of a lot of sweat uh, yeah. to do it, but but we did it. <laughs> um, what for the search for the researchers? You were on the uh, you were the search for the chancellor of the Purdue Calumet campus. Just tell them a little bit how they're involved. And, uh, I foresee a question, why wasn't it local? But, and what was the involvement of you? It was because it was an, a regional campus. Uh, I was the only one that was not directly affiliated with the Calumet campus that was on the committee with it. Um, because we are a university system, rather than just local autonomous campuses all over that are not affiliated with a larger system, President Jiski felt it was important to have somebody from West Lafayette um, on that committee. And among other things that I did in working in the executive vice president's office, I did a lot of work with the regional campuses. And so they apparently thought that I was a logical person to get a chance to drive up north every Friday afternoon. Mm -hmm. 
did the executive vice president have some, uh, I'm thinking of a researcher question, some involvement? Uh, they didn't, uh, what was their involvement with the regional campus? Just liaison more than any? Because it was independent pretty much by that time, were they not? All except the North Central campus. Okay. And the North Central campus was another one that we were working with and helped them. They are now autonomous, right. but worked through a process where that would happen. They were academically autonomous, but if we're one university, we just can't all run off and do our own thing. There, there has to be some coordination. Uh, and, and so you had to get a lot of people sitting down talking with each other to see, even though they were autonomous, to, to make right. it happen so that we, we were a university we're with it. And part of my work with the Commission for Higher Education was taking down any new degree program, any campus, and this was part of state law at that point, uh, wanted to offer to the commission because the commission had final authority in approving all new degrees for the state of Indiana. So I was doing that for all campuses, and through that, I had a pretty good feel for what was happening uh, on the regional campuses, and I really wasn't a stranger. To, to the people up there. So I, I'd have been their advocate of, of trying to make programs that they wanted to to advance. Um, and you knew where the they were coming from and how you could share their information with the commission. So they felt comfortable in dealing with, with you and you working with them. Now, my impression was that they didn't feel that I was an intruder or an outsider or somebody looking for West Lafayette. They may have, but they didn't make me feel that way. <laughs> 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 Let's talk about the CIC, the Center for uh, Institutional Cooperation, Academic Leadership Fellows Program. That was a marvelous program, and I, again, was a member of the group that was the, the founding group for that. Um, we felt that we had a lot of leadership resources on all of our campuses, and we had a lot of potential leaders on our, all of our campuses, but we weren't doing a very good job trying to help them develop their leadership skills. There were a number of national programs uh, available at that time, but people had to take time off their job or if they didn't have a sabbatic, get a leave, do something of that sort, to, to go to Harvard, to go to Bryn Mawr, to, to take in some of these programs. And they were very expensive programs. Uh, and what you were doing is one person a year uh, was doing this. And so we sat down and said, is there a better way? Is there something that we can do uh, within the CIC? And got the idea, yes, we could. And uh, so, so we developed this program. And it was set up so that each institution would select four to six people a year, emerging faculty leaders, uh, to be a fellow for a year. Uh, it was something they did in addition to their job, but it wasn't that time consuming. We had three seminars that were about two and a half days each um, in length each year when the fellows from all of the schools would get together and we would bring in national speakers for it. Uh, but we only had to pay for one speaker and we had 11 institutions taking advantage of this where we had a lot of just CIC people talking because we had some of the top leadership in the nation in, in, in leadership in our institutions. And then we had a program back on our home campuses that, that each liaison, and I was a Purdue liaison for a long time, designed for their fellows with it. And it, it's a program that continues today, and I'm not sure whether it's up to its 25th anniversary yet, but it's got to be it's getting, be very it, it's, getting very, right. it's getting very close to right. it, and it is still alive and vibrant. And uh, last time I talked with some of the people that were associated with it, they said, nobody is saying we shouldn't do this anymore. Mm -hmm. It's become very cost-effective. Purdue's had a lot of leaders that have gone through it and uh, then have gone and taken on leadership. Sure. I've also had a few that have said after the end of the year, no, this isn't for me. And and what a wonderful decision for somebody, a conclusion for somebody to be able to reach right. that it isn't for them before they get in it and decide it isn't for right. them. Yeah. Let's switch gears a little bit. Let's talk about Ivy Tech mm -hmm. and your interaction with the Ivy Tech uh, system. Well, one of the things that was pretty clear that the Commission for Higher Education wanted to have happen was they wanted a community college in the state of Indiana. And that would have a major impact, not only on Ivy Tech, which was a technical college, but also on the state's four-year four universities with it. 
Um, they got the state legislature involved in it. And the first thing that the state legislature mandated was that all of the public institutions in the state of Indiana had to have at least 10 courses that were transferable among all of them. And so the state institutions were, were given the mandate to sit down and figure out how to make it happen and do it. And I chaired that committee statewide with it. And I think to our surprise and everybody else's surprise, within two meetings, we had it done. Um, so we did have 10 courses that were transferable statewide. But it was also pretty clear to many of us at Purdue and clearly to the folks at Ivy Tech that something was going to happen. And we either could drag our feet and have somebody that didn't know too much about what should be doing design it, or we could start it. And so Betty Doversberger, who was the chancellor at Ivy Tech Lafayette, and I started conversations, what can we do to make something good happen since it's going to happen anyhow? And uh, ever so fortunate, Betty was the one that was doing this for two reasons. One, she was a Purdue grad. She had a PhD. She understood what four-year universities were all about. And secondly, she had worked in a community college as well as Ivy Tech's technical college with it. So she understood the problems four-year institutions were going to have with this too. So we just sat down and tried to figure out how we were gonna make this work. And we did it really a course at a time with it. And we were both committed to the fact that this was not going to be something that was just out there, but it was something that was really going to work and help students because if it wasn't, it shouldn't be done. Um, but it needed to be done with it. So, so my role was in working with her and then working with Purdue faculty, trying to, to get them to see that this was an opportunity for them. And probably the best thing that happened was Ivy Tech decided that it really needed to revise its curriculum. And in so doing, they invited faculty from the four-year institutions to come and help them do that. And Purdue was invited to send its best people from mathematics, chemistry, physics, and philosophy. And we literally did send our best people to do it so that when a person like George Bodner came back and said, yes, that chemistry course is 112 that we are teaching here, um, and I'm gonna work with them to see that it is, it began to make things happen. And then that just continued and it's, it's just continued to roll on and on and on now so that we do have a, a community college that I think is a workable one within the state of Indiana. Mm -hmm. And that uh, some good things are happening for students in moving back and forth between the two institutions. Right. That's a challenge, though. It takes a lot of time to, to work that out. It takes it, it takes a lot of time, curtains. but it was it was very important. Right. And um, we did it a course at a time. And then, and then there were some degree programs that began to look like they were going to work. And it's and the faculty is the is the group responsible for this. Right. Um, and one of the challenges facing that is to get on the same page, and they know the value of this and what the purpose behind it would be for this course uh, transferable ability? Well, no, I think the faculties at both institutions do. Uh, and the only- In the early days, I mean. Yes, I mean, no, in, in the early days they did. And they, and they realized nobody wanted students to transfer one way or the other and fail. They wanted them to succeed. And the or only- lose the credits because they're transferring. Well, yeah. it, that, that was a piece of it. I mean, that would have happened students tried it, uh, they didn't get the credit, and why should they take something over again with it? So that was the whole purpose of the transferability. But it has to be something more than just a paper transfer. It has to be a knowledge transfer, so when the student goes to another institution as a transfer student, they have the background to succeed at that next institution with it. Mm -hmm. And of course, with this, um, a student had to apply and be accepted to Purdue, they had to go through the regular admissions piece. Just because they took a transferable course didn't mean that they could move over with it. Mm -hmm. So there there was that safeguard that was, mm -hmm. was, was in there as well with it. Right. 
but at least early on when I was working with it, these students were doing very well. And I defined very well as that they were making satisfactory academic progress. And it's continued on. Have they, uh, there's uh, quite, a, are there more courses now, do you know? Oh, there are, there, there are many, many more courses now, and there are degree programs now. Uh, where you can take a two year, get a two year associate degree and you can transfer in as a junior. And the faculties have just, they've been very creative in what they've done, and I applaud them for doing that yeah. because it's, you know, it's just for the benefit of students. Sure. And that's what we're here for. That's right. <laughs> right. At least that's what I've been here for. <laughs> right. Talking about uh, transferring, I make a couple comments on that combination of the undergraduate studies program and that uh, university division. Mm -hmm. um, for the researchers, you might want to make a comment on what each of those programs was and then the combination. Okay. Well, earlier on, I had mentioned to you about the Provost Task Forces. And one of the recommendations from the both the Recruitment and the Retention Task Force was we needed a port of entry at Purdue for students that were bright students, well qualified, but they really didn't know what they wanted to major in. Because until more recently, the only way you could be admitted to Purdue was you applied to a, a school, which is now a college, and you were admitted to that. There were too many bright students that we felt were not looking at Purdue because they didn't know what they wanted to do. And it wasn't that they didn't have a clue, they had too many clues, and they needed help in sorting this out with it. And so we went back, and, and Bob Ringel, who was on one of those task forces then, was, was now the Executive Vice President for Student Services, and we sat down and said, aha, maybe we have a chance here uh, now with it. And so he and I started trying to develop this concept a little more as to, as to what it would be. And uh, so it's, it started out that it was just a port of entry. The only way you could be in this program was to be admitted as a new student, not a transfer student or not somebody who'd been at Purdue. And that it would be a program that would be... Um, quite advising intensive with it. There would be a small ratio of, of a student to advise each advisor, whereas in schools there were fairly large ratios uh, with this. And they would have lots of time and there would also be a course that, that all the entering students in the program had to take uh, that was very advising intensive and did a lot of testing and a lot of surveying and a lot of looking at programs around the university. and, and uh, what was involved in them and what did the graduates of those programs do is in so that you could begin to find something that was really a good match for you and then CODO into that program. Um, no degrees were offered nor are they now an undergraduate studies program and you can only be in it for four years. So Dick Grace was was named founding director of that program but at the same time we had a program in the Dean of Students office called University Division, which was for students who had started at Purdue, but then were disenchanted with what their major was and didn't know what they wanted to do. So they went into this University Division program to try and figure out what they wanted their major to be. So as, as Bob and I talked about it, we said, no, it doesn't make too much sense to have one program for entering students and one for students that have been there with it. And so we entered in conversation with the Dean of Students office and that was Tony Hawkins then and the Vice President for Student Services who was Tom Robertson and we all kind of concluded it really made a lot of sense to to merge the two programs and to merge the staffs uh, with them and so that's what was done. Were there many students in that the university division had been running for some time though had it? It had been running for a long time okay. but incoming students were not admitted to it. It was only students who had been here. And weren't sure whether they wanted COD or where to go next. Or where to go next, or they weren't doing well, and they or oh my goodness, you know, I can't get through chemistry, and chemistry is required in this field, so I've got to go find something that doesn't require chemistry, you know, whatever it was. And the, and the folks in the university division were doing a wonderful job working with those students. Lots of advising. Lots, lots of advising. And, you know, the two programs were just working with different populations, yeah. but they were trying to do the same thing, so it made sense to, to merge them so 
some of the staff that were working in the Dean of Students Office with the university division went over to the undergraduate studies program. Okay. And then after Dick, uh, Susan Ockerheide, is she the one that Dick Warren handles it now? Right, um, yeah. Susan followed Dick. Mm -hmm. Okay. That was one of my better hires because I was I had a, a administrative responsibility for the undergraduate studies program, and Bob had hired Dick, and then when Dick retired, it was my job to hire his successor, and I, I think Sue's done well with it. She was over in athletics, wasn't she? Mm -hmm. One time they did it over there. She was the the head of their academic support program. Where are they? Uh, they're housed over in Schleman Hall. Is that where the program? Well, yeah. it was housed over in Schleman, oh. but uh, Schleman, the, the offices that were in Schleman quickly outgrew their space, and so uh, undergraduate studies is over in Young Hall now. Oh, okay. All right. Let's talk about the Women's Resource Office. Uh, you were the interim director for several years, located in the railway building, right? And no. It was wasn't, it, no, it wasn't, it wasn't it, the Women's Resource Office was a one-person office at that point, and they, uh, for a number of years, had a faculty member that was appointed for about a three-year term uh, as director, and they were a half-time director and then half-time faculty person with it. Um, the director's term ended, and... Dick Grace and Tip Tyler decided that I would be the perfect person to, to be the interim director of this, since they hadn't decided quite what direction they wanted the office to go. And I told them with everything else I was doing that I wasn't going to be able to spend half time in this, um, number one. Number two, it was not an area that I had a lot of expertise in, but if they really thought that I was the person to do it, I would focus the office, I would narrow the focus considerably and just work with resolution of grievances that faculty members had before they went into the, uh, of disputes, I guess I should say, before they went into the grievance process to see if we couldn't get something worked out. And that I would gather data for them each year so we could look at how we were doing and there already was a salary analysis. But I really didn't have time to do programming and, and things of that sort, so they agreed that was going to be okay. Well, as, as you might imagine, that the women on campus were not terribly excited about that, that this office had much a narrower focus now. And some of them were very good friends of mine, and they let me know that. And I felt all along that the office ought to be uh, staffed by at least one full-time person and, and probably more than that. It ought to be involved in much, much more than it had even under the faculty. What my friends didn't quite understand why I wasn't doing all of that. And um, Tip Tyler understood that there was a lot of dissatisfaction with it. And I, and I was walking on kind of thin ground at this point. Uh, having to say to him, well, that's about all I can do with every, I was in his office then, with everything else that you got me doing around here with it. And finally I said, you know, you, you really need to sit down and take a look at this and bring in some of these people that, that you hear complaining about it because they've got some really good ideas. Um, so he did that. And it came about then that they decided there really needed to be a full-time position uh, not occupied by people that were doing other things whose interests really happened to be if they were a faculty member of their research or administrative things like I was doing. Uh, and so a full-time position was created. And, and Tip had been one that was always interested in affirmative action. Uh, that, that was, I don't know that how well known that was. But that was, was really something that, that, that he was very, very interested in. And I remember the day he came to me and he said, Carolyn, I've got this together. We're going to do it. And he showed me the job description on it. And I said, Tip, that is a wonderful job description. And then he ripped off a piece of tape and he had the title Vice President on it. And I said, that's even better. And he said, I'm going to take it down to the president and get it approved. He and I have been talking about it. <laughs> I said, great. And he came back, and he had the piece of paper, and it had Stephen Baring's signature on it. And he said, I got everything I wanted on this. I said, good for you. 
what didn't you get? He said, the physician's going to report to Steve now. <laughs> and so that's why uh, the vice president, and it became then the vice president for human relations, women's resource office title was left off it. And uh, Judy Yappa was the one that was hired and she reported to the president rather than the academic vice president. And then of course she was the one that convinced them we really needed to have a women's resource office. So I came back with the full-time director. <laughs> Long way around telling what actually happened yeah. with it. Uh, let's see. Uh, I'm trying to think. I have. Uh, this uh, concludes part one of the interview with Carolyn Jones. We will continue shortly. Thank you.